Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen. I'm currently running the IDEA seminar for the BTPC this year. I'm very happy to uh, introduce our first speaker for the semester, uh, Dr. Peter White from Columbia University. Uh, he has a long uh, distinguished history of uh, teaching mathematics and quantum mechanics at Columbia. He's also the uh, very illustrious owner and runner of the blog, uh, Not Even Wrong, which is quite popular in the physics community. And today he's here to talk about uh, one of his uh, uh, ways of thinking about solving some of the issues of high energy physics, which is uh, through Euclidean twister unification. So with that said, um, Peter, you can take it away. Uh, you can come switch spots with me. Um, possibly, but I think everyone's able to just join. Yeah, it looks like everyone's just here. We have 10 people. Oh, here we go. Commit, commit, commit. Okay, so I will leave that screen closed, but yeah, if you see that, um, you know, you can take care of that. And do you have a click, is the clicker working? Clicker or? battery is dead, so unless someone has a AAA battery, yeah. So. Uh, okay, we'll go Okay, let's see, so where is, can I see if people can, to the, people can actually see me. So. Yeah. So let's see if we can. Uh, I, I, I guess I, I guess I have to be. I'm afraid I may have to be. If I'm going to have to click on everything, I may have to sit down and be here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So let's see. And then this is going to go. Yeah. Okay. So 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 can can can, can those of you on Zoom sit hear me? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'll get started then. Okay, and I guess we've got another. Yeah. Okay, should I? Okay, taking care of that. I can also do two separate screens. I, I, I can do it. Okay. 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 So anyway, so so th so, th so thanks a lot for the for the invitation. It's uh, anyway, it, it's it's very very strange to kind of I mean, get get on a mode of transportation and go somewhere and then meet all sorts of new people. It feels like I, I haven't done this and and it was a very very weird thing to do, but it's very 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 pleasant also. It, it's really great to be able to do this after this uh, long period of being relatively isolated. Okay, so what I want to, okay, so I guess I'll get started. So, and, and again, thanks for the invitation. Really, it really is wonderful to be doing this for many reasons. Let's see. Okay, so what, what I want to do is I'll, I'll start by giving you an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Oh, and um, so the, the first thing I want to do is, is talk about what, in, in some sense, is kind of the strangest aspect of what I'm trying to do, which is a really kind of, a, I'm making a very unusual claim that there's something much more non trivial going on about the relationship between quantum field theory and Euclidean and Minkowski space. And it, it took me kind of a long, long time to realize this and believe it. And I still have trouble getting people to believe this. So I will, I'll spend a bunch of time on that. And then I wanna say some kind of basic things about four dimensional geometry and about how, um, how, how that works, the relationship and just some kind of fundamental things about four dimensional geometry and spinners that are kind of behind what I'm doing. And then, let's see. Okay, and then I, I want to explain the kind of ba basic idea of, of how this, this idea about geometry leads to a, a natural kind of thought about how you might be able to unify gravity and the weak interactions. And this is something I know that Stefan has worked on in, in, in the past, and he was wrote one of the more, one of the kind of basic papers that people are trying to do this. So in some sense, what I'm doing is kind of, is, is along the lines of the same inspiration as, as his. But, but, but what I want to do, but one kind of basic thing that's going to make this work, what I'm trying to do work, involves uh, twister theory. And I don't really have time to kind of teach a whole course on twister theory here, but I want to kind of explain some, some really kind of, to me, very, very compelling facts about how to think about four-dimensional geometry in terms of twisters. And I'll try to get, get a little bit of that. And then the, the idea is that once you have this geometrical picture, you end up with a, a very, very nice... Um, way of, of that this in some sense encodes and packages the basic uh, symmetries that you have in the standard model and in, in gravity. And so the idea is you can hope to do, create a different kind of unit unification, different kind of unification using these ideas. And then, um, then, then at some point I'll have to then admit about there, there's a lot I don't understand about this. There's a lot that still has to happen before you actually have, have actually a really, a, a real theory that you completely, uh, understand what you're talking about. So and there's that to do. And I'll just say a, a bit about what, um, where I think this is going. Okay, so that, that's the, uh, anyway, 
that, that's the outline. Oh, and then, and then just the last thing to say, so I'll, these, these slides will be up on, on my website. You can get those, and I guess this is being recorded. So you, you guys will put this up on YouTube. And the, um, I wrote a paper based upon this uh, and put it up on the archive earlier this year. And then I've learned a bunch of it, a bunch about this since then. So there's actually a new version of the paper, which is, you can probably find it on my website and I'll soon, um, after a little bit more work, I'll kind of update this and put it, this, this will be a, a version two on the, uh, on the archive soon. And that's corresponds more to what I'm saying today. Okay, so first of all, the, the, the first thing I wanna to try to convince you is that you really should, if, if you wanna talk about quantum field theory, you, you really should be defining it in, um, in, in Euclidean space and not in Minkowski space time. And so Schwinger was the first one who kind of started to make this argument back in the 50s. And just to say a bit about it, what, what one kind of motivation for it is that if you believe that path integrals are the way to go, that if you, if, if, if you decide to, um, to, to do path integrals, if you decide to just uh, say, well, I'm gonna do it, things in work, work in uh, Minkowski space, the Lorentz metric, then you end up with trying to do that, the integral with, you're trying to integrate this phase over this infinite natural space. And one thing you can tell is if you start asking a mathematical physicist who tries to actually prove anything about quantum field theory is they'll tell you, well, that's actually, there's no way to actually make sense of that in, in any rigorous way. And if you ask a lattice gauge theorists like myself, I kind of started out my um, career doing calculations of lattice gauge theory. And if you try to integrate a phase, make a discrete version of it and, and, and sum over a larger and larger, larger added lattices of integrating these phases, you quickly find out that you're going to get complete nonsense because all your you know, everything you're going to see is just going to be an artifact of your approximation. You, you'll never get anything that way. So you can't numerically, you, the thing on the left is useless. Rigorously, it's pretty useless. And so my training based upon this, being a graduate student and work this way was that, well, of course, the only sensible way to think about quantum field theory is in Euclidean space. And, I found my shock and horror over the years that when I, that other people feel the absolute opposite, that, uh, that doing things in Euclidean space is some weird thing that, unphysical thing you shouldn't be doing that you really should be in Minkowski space. But I'm just kind of going to say that this, this is the philosophy and the ideology behind what I'm trying to do is to, uh, to argue that you really, if you want to write down things that make sense and actually do sense, you, you really need to be thinking about how to do quantum field theory in a space-time and Euclidean signature. And um, that late, later at the end of the day, once you've done your calculations, you're gonna to have to somehow re retrieve what we observe or observe space-time by analytic continuation and from imaginary time to, to real time. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so when you're looking through Euclidean and Minkowski space, is it, isn't that the form of the integral exchange? Or you're saying in the actual, it's just the inverse of well, and the first thing, it, it's really, I mean, there's, well, what, what, what the, the main problem is, I mean, quantum field theory in some sense is much more complex. You see exactly the same thing on quantum mechanics. If you try and write down just a path integral for quantum mechanics, you know, you're integrating over all paths in space, a phase factor or a not e to the minus the integral of the velocity squared. So, so you know, are you integrating over an international space, some nice thing which is damped as, as you get crazier and crazier, or are you just integrating a phase over everything? And, and integrating a phase over everything is just going to, um, anyway, so, so I, I'll, I'll try to make this point a little bit here, but th this is not something tricky about quantum field theory. This is really basic about quantum mechanics. Simple, look at the theory of a free particle and one dimension of quantum mechanics, and you'll see all these, you see these problems. Does that, does that help? Okay, and as I say, so, so for, from the quantum field theory point of view, you always see this that if, if you try and do just do perturbation theory and, and, and quantum field theory, you know, people say, well, okay, let's start teaching you how to compute Feynman diagrams, you got to compute propagators, so you got to compute, you got to take the Fourier transform of something that's like this, where omega p is the square root of p squared plus m squared. And then the minute you, you, you try and write down the propagator in your quantum field theory book, you say, wait a minute, I, I'm being told I got to integrate through these two poles. And so then there's a long song and dance about what to do about the poles. And, um, and the uh, one way of saying, you know, so the long song and dance has to be kind of physically motivated to get causality right. But one way to, to, to motivate kind of mathematic, mathematically, the, 
the physically correct thing to do ends up to be saying that you should analytically continue the calculation in, you know, in, in, into, you know, in, in, and, and do it in, in Euclidean space time. So to say a little bit more about this. So, so this is something I hadn't seen, it took me a while to realize this is something that's not in all the quantum field theory books, but it, that should be, or this is even a fact about quantum mechanics again, that if you, um, if you think about your, the, about anything like your two point function, your propagator as a function of, of complex time, what happens, I can see here, it, it, it is, is this, that the, um, so if, so, so here's the real time axis. So what you find is, is that, you know, if the real, if your, your real time is space-like, if the time is too small, is the time is smaller than the, the, than the distance here. So things haven't had enough time to get to, for, for singles to, prop, singles to propagate. So this is kind of, this is, so this is, so this thing in the middle is kind of the, uh, this, this is this, this is the space-like region. So there, everything is, um, you know, th th this propagator is a perfectly, is a perfectly well-behaved object, it's fine. But what happens is that the, um, the minute, if you go into the time-like region, you, 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 you find that what's happening is that the formula you're writing down is actually very badly behaved and ill-defined on, you know, on these, in these black areas. And you're, what you really need to do is you really need to define it as a distribution there. It's not an actual function and a way to, so it's something that if you feed it a nice enough function, you'll get, you'll get a reasonable result, but it's not a function itself. And the way to think of that distribution is as a boundary value of a holomorphic function. So you, you, you've actually got something which is a nice holomorphic thing in this upper half plane and, and, you're take, and you take the limit of that thing as you approach the, the you know, this, this time-like region as you approach real time. And then that object that you're getting in that limit is something that you can integrate against nice enough functions and get, get a sensible answer. So th this is actual the nature. And this is, I mean, there, there's kind of a theory of, of objects that behave like that, distributions defined this way, and they're often called hyperfunctions. So in some sense, even the simplest propagator for a simple free particle is, is really kind of best thought of as a, as a hyperfunction. But if, if you're in Minkowski space, if you're, but, but what happens is if you instead look at imaginary time, then everything is perfectly well-defined here. You have a perfectly nice function of a perfectly ordinary kind. It's actually well defined by the formulas for tau positive because you're, you're integrating e to the minus tau times things that are positive. And then you can use by analytic, you can define in the analytic continuation, by analytic continuation, you can just get the thing for tau negative. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so so this, so this so one difference between Minkowski and Euclidean is, is this, that, that the in Minkowski space, your simplest things, even for free particles, the two-point function is a hyper function. It's a tricky object. In Euclidean space, it's a perfectly nice object. But some other things that happen are, there's, and, and maybe, a way to think about this more more physically is to realize that if you're in Minkowski space, the, the one thing that you're kind of breaking a symmetry in a way which you don't always think about, which is that you always you you decide that physics is always going to states are always going to have positive energy, so you have to kind of decide what's positive energy, what's negative energy, and you there's kind of a basic postulate of, of however you're going to do your quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, which says that. I'm going to, states are going to have positive energy. They're going to go off to positive infinity, not down to negative infinity, if you want stability of the world. So that's a basic extra fact that it's, it, it's not normally written down as one of the axioms of quantum mechanics, but it should be. You have to add that to the axioms of quantum mechanics and you have to have that when you do quantum field theory, otherwise you're not going to get anything sensible. But now in Euclidean space, what happens is that if, if you have the condition of having positive energy in Euclidean, if you in Euclidean space, um, be becomes that you know that if you try and do the, the Fourier transform and ask about the function as a function of a complex time, what's going to happen is that it's going to make sense if the um, if e is positive, if the um, if, if if the imaginary component of the time is 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 positive, then you're get the, this integral is going to make sense. If it's if it's negative, it's not going to make sense. So the asymmetry when you go to Euclidean space, the asymmetry between positive and negative energy becomes an asymmetry between whether you're holomorphic, you know, whether you're 
whether you're whole, whether you're holomorphic up here on the, on the upper half plane or whether you're holomorphic anyway. so, so, so so what you're doing is when you go to Euclidean space you're working with objects that whose analytic continuations are are, are, are nice in this upper half plane and are basically that formula it doesn't make any sense down down in the lower half plane okay so there's this inherent asymmetry in in um, in, in, the, in any Euclidean formulation of uh, quantum field theory between po positive imaginary time and negative imaginary time. They're two completely different things, which is very different than in Minkowski space, where, which is completely symmetric, basically, between you know, modulo maybe a, a, a conjugation. It doesn't really matter whether you're going in positive, positive time or negative time. Okay, okay then, then just some more things. That if you start to get into the subject and, and look at what's, how, how you're actually going to define the theory, you find that um, what happens in Minkowski space is that the, the, the field operators satisfy the, uh, some kind of wave equation, whatever. But, it, but if you look at what happens in, in Euclidean quantum field theory, you find that it, it's something quite different. There, there is no, um, these field operators, uh, operators are not things that satisfy an equation of motion. They're always, they're always off shell in some sense. That if, the, uh, if you look at the, um, I mean, the, for instance, if you, if you just take the Klein Gordon equation that, uh, a free scalar field satisfies and change the time, the ddt squared to a plus ddt squared. You'll have create. You'll have an equation that has no global solution. There's no, so you don't. You, you can't say that that's the you that you clean time. We're going to satisfy the the same equation of motion just with t going to i t because that that equation has no solution. So you can't you can't do that. And, and the other thing that you, you find is that in Minkowski space, field operators, you know, very crucially don't commute. And uh, this makes it, at least if you're in like, unless you're space-like or something. And in, in Euclidean quantum field theory, field operators are always commuting objects. And so it, it's a very, a subject with a very different flavor. And it, it's kind of like statistical mechanics instead of um, quantum mechanics, because, you know, it, it, it's not a complicated story about on non-commuting operators on Hilbert space. It's a, the operators all commute. And, the one, and, and as I was kind of trying, trying to say, so what, the, the one big difference, which it took me a long time to realize was that in the, um, in Minkowski space, you can specify what it, if you want to specify what's the physical state space, you have to say, well, let's look at solutions of the Quine Garden equation, but let's just like look at the positive energy ones. And you can do, since the, Solutions. I mean, there's kind of a an energy momentum hyperboloid. It's got two pieces: a positive energy one and a negative energy one. You can just say, well, I'm just going to look at the positive energy one, and that's an, a nice Lorentz covariant statement. That Lorentz group just kind of moves you around on that hyperboloid. It doesn't mix the two hyperboloids. The problem with is that you can't get away with the same thing in um, in Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, if you when you say, okay, I'm going to treat positive imaginary time and negative imaginary time differently, if that that breaks four dimensional rotations. So you can't, the kind of Euclidean analog of boosts, things that, which, would, which would mix space and imaginary time, those are gonna get, get messed up by, by, the, by this specification of saying, I'm only gonna look at positive imaginary time, okay? So you don't, um, so, so, so the kind of Lorentz group works acts very nicely in the physical state space and Minkowski space. When you go to Euclidean space, what you thought was a symmetry of the theory, this, this SO4 is actually no longer a symmetry of the theory. In the, it's a, um, and I guess this is, yeah, this is what I was saying, trying to say here. So the, I mean, what, what you find is that the, um, and anyway, so here, the, the minute you start, if you go away from just thinking about endpoint functions and say, I'm going to start thinking about what states and operators are. What are the states of this theory? Um, in Minkowski space, the, you, you have Lorentz group acts, but the what you would think would be the analytic continuation of the Lorentz group is the rotation group. Um, you can create a, a Fox space story, which is SO4 invariant, but but those Fox, those Fox space states are not physical states. They kind of correspond in some sense to trajectories in imaginary time of states, they don't correspond to states. And so you have to, um, so you, 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 there is, it's confusing. There is a nice SO4 covariant story in Euclidean space, but the states are not, it's not about physical states. You have to do something. 
And to, and to get from, if you start doing what I say you should do, which is start thinking in Euclidean space and you set the, everything up using all the invariances, then you find this is all well and good. But if you want to get back to, to Minkowski space, if you ever want to find the physical states in this big Euclidean box space that you've created, you need to um, you need you need you need to choose a notion. You need to choose a notion of um, you know you need to choose a direction that that direction is is going to be imaginary time, and then you, that gives you a, a hyperplane, and then you have a reflection in that hyperplane, and you can use reflection in that hyperplane to define um, what are the physical states, and to and to and to show that your SO four covariant theory becomes an SO three one covariant theory. And so, but but it's it, it, this is really a, this is really a, a crucial piece of piece of structure. And um, I should say that I've, I've had some problems with people saying, "Oh, well, what you're doing is you're telling me that you, you want you want to break Lorentz invariance." And I'm saying, "No, I do not want to break Lorentz invariance. I want Lorentz invariance." And I'm telling you that if you want Lorentz invariance and you want to work in Euclidean space, you have to break Euclidean invariance. That's the only way you're going to get Lorentz invariance. So this is not a theory of of, 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 of um, you know of, of broken Lorentz symmetry. It's a theory. Of, it's, it's it's a theory. It's just a realization that if you want Lorentz symmetry, you need to break Euclidean symmetry. Okay. That's it. Okay. Okay. So that's first part of the story. Let me. So this, so this. Okay. So 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 now what I want to do is I want to do four dimensional geometry, and so that now we're on the next part of, the, of this. And so this is it's funny. We were actually just talking about this. Just downstairs, and, and Stefan and uh, was that was asking was it what they were they were talking and, and exactly this thing came up, which is about how do you, that if you want to think about four dimensional geometry, a, a nice a really good thing to do is to is to write elements of write four dimensional vectors as two by two complex matrices. I mean, you, you you can do this using gamma matrices or sigma sigma matrices. There are various formulas for doing this. You can write down the formulas, but here's one way to do it. It, it works especially nicely if you um, if if you you know t take not just your your normal four real four dimensions but you let everything be complex. Then you just here's one one way of doing this. You can just identify four complex four complex numbers with with two by two complex matrices using the the, the Pauli matrices this way. And and if you compute the the determinant of this matrix, you get the usual norm squared, you know, z, z zero squared plus z one squared, et cetera. And, um, and then you, you find that if you want to understand what are the transformations of four complex dimensions that, that leave the norm squared invariant, what are the orthogonal transformations in this complex thing? Well, you can, you can keep the, you just got to preserve the determinant. So you can multiply left and right by things with determinant one and the determinant will stay the same. So this says that the, the kind of complex version of the orthogonal group in four dimensions is actually breaks up into a product of, of two SL2C, two, two, SL, two by two complex matrices determinant one. And this is the only dimension in which this happens, that the orthogonal group turns out to, to, to actually have two pieces. And every other dimension, the orthogonal group is a simple group. Here it is. Now, if, if you do the same thing in with, with taking those x those z's to be real, and then you get Euclidean geometry, and you get a so we, again we're just relating um, four real numbers to two to two by two complex matrices, but but now they're two by two complex matrices with a certain kind of reality property. There's a certain property, and but but and, and then what happens is that if you want to know again, still the, the determinant is the um, is, it, it, it is the length squared. If you compute the determinant of that, it, it should come out to x0 squared plus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. What's going to preserve this again is going to be left and right multiplication by um, determinant one things. But in order to preserve the reality property you want, they have to be unitary matrices. So you're going to get what you find is that you can you can that you can do rotations in two dimensions with with two two SU2s, you can write, write or left multiply by, by an SU2, let's see. Yeah, oh, sorry, let me go back to how I say this. And, and, and so the, and, and it turns out if you, um, if, if you 
throw in an extra minus, if, if you multiply both of them by a minus sign, the minus signs are going to cancel. So, so for each kind of rotation, normal rotation you're thinking about, there's there's two possible choices of, of SU2s that will do it. So, so you have what's called the spin double cover, essentially, which corresponds to the fact that there's a, a minus sign ambiguity there. And there, there's another, in this twister story, one, it turns out it's often useful to think in terms of quaternions. So instead of thinking of two by two matrices and Pauli matrices, you can translate into the language of quaternions if you know that, if you know that, and say that way to do Euclidean geometry is to write for real numbers as a quaternion, use the standard quaternion norm. And so here the conjugate, it just takes the IJK to minus IJK. And then um, and then rot rotations are just given by uh, left to right multiplying by quaternions with it, which have length one. And, and the group of quaternions of length one is the same thing as SU2. Okay, now if you want to do Minkowski geometry, we just change, change one of the signs here and do this. And we're looking at different kinds of two by two complex matrices. And now what's different is that the, um, the norm is preserved by left and right, again, by left and right multiplication by SL2C elements. But if you know what the, um, if you know what the right one is in order to, to, pre to preserve this, this real form, to preserve, the, to preserve this form of it, you have to, the left-hand one has to be the, um, has, to, has to be related to it. It has to be um, the inverse um, adjoint if I got that right. And uh, so, so now you, instead of it using SU2, you can use, you can use anything in SL2C, but it's, um, and, you, and you can do this. And, and now the, so, so, so the, um, the same, so, so these rotations preserving the Minkowski space norm are what we call the elements of spin three one. And it's called this, and it's just given by the group SL2C, all two by two matrices determinant one. And again, again, it's a double cover of what we normally view, what do you think normally you think of as the Lorentz group? Again, because you can multiply GL and GR both by a minus sign and look at the same thing. Okay. Okay. So now, so, so I find this very, very useful, partly because it. Wait, sorry, what? This? Yeah, could, could, yeah. So, because the in, in general, for general complex, you've got two SL two Cs, but and if you want to preserve this 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 form, you have to then once you know one of them, the other one is determined. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 so the crucial thing to re realize is that is that there's something. There, there, there are very different natures of what happens in Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, it's not a simple group. It breaks up into you know, the spin group or the rotation group breaks up into these two pieces, SU2 plus SU2. In Minkowski space, it's doing something quite different. It's a simple group. And um, yeah, so, 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 so there, there's a very different nature to what it means to do a rotation in Lorentz space, in Lorentz signature, to do a rotation in, in, in um, Euclidean signature. This is part of the whole problem here. Okay, and so I think this is actually a very useful way to think about spinners, that if you've got, um, you can, you, that, and this is kind of what we were talking about downstairs. That, it, that that what if you what you can think of these two by two complex matrices as linear maps from one seat, one pairs of, compl of complex numbers to other pairs of complex numbers, and these are your kind of your vial spinners or your half spinner spaces, your either right hand or left hand spinners. So I want to think of um, so so I I, I want to think of, ve of vectors as being things that linear maps that take right handed spinners to left handed spinners. And uh, you can, and then, and then, then, then corresponding to this business of kind of left and right multiplying by SL by SL two Cs, you have um, you have actions on the spinners which are just just multiplications by SL two C. So I think this this at least to me is maybe the most convincing way to motivate why what spinner geometry is in four dimensions. Why that even if you're you're used to just thinking about vectors, where where are these spinners going to come from? Well, this this is maybe the, the cleanest way of saying where spinners come from. I think. Okay, and then and again, just what I was saying before, in Euclidean space, these two um, these two things are are in, are are independent. In Minkowski space, they're determined by each other, and it's SL two C, not SU two. Okay, 
so one thing, one, one thing at first got me interested in, and, and I think the first version of this paper I, I wrote, I think had kind of a mistaken expository idea was to start out by explaining this problem. And the new version of the paper improves exposition by moving this all to an appendix, I think. But, but and this is, it's actually first got me interested in this problem, even when I was a graduate student, I was doing lattice gauge theory calculations. I said, okay, great. Now I know how to calculate with gauge fields, but what about um, what about matter fields? So I want to put matter fields in it and, and how, what's the right kind of geometry for that? And so how do you do, I have to do it in Euclidean space. So how do I put, how do I put spinners and matter fields on, on my lattice? And this, so I started thinking about this and then it started fun, realizing it, it, it's a very weird story. And um, one way of seeing the problem, there, there's, there's a long literature about it, which is very confusing. But one way of seeing the problem is that if you write down, you write down the Minkowski to, Propagator, the two-point function, which you know you want, then you 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 look at its analytic continuation. You say, okay, this is what I want to get Euclidean theory. So now, how am I going to write a Euclidean Fox space, Euclidean field theory that will do this? And what you find out find out is exactly because of these different properties of the spin groups in Minkowski versus Euclidean, you can't actually. Um, the only way to do this is that really involves like dub doubling the number of fields. You basically have to introduce new fields, which are, which are gonna be hit, which are gonna transform under the other SU2. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to write down things that are kind of rotationally invariant and behave properly. So this is a, this is a long story, but, and, and you kind of find this in any quantum field theory book. If you, it says, well, if you really wanna do these calculations using spinner fields, you have to kind of introduce, you know, you have to kind of double the fields and introduce a psi bar, which is unrelated to a psi. And there's a, a long story about that. But um, but again, there, this is just kind of a one motivation for something funny going on here, that it, it, that the, the relationship between the Euclidean and Minkowski space time theory is even more very tricky in the spinner case, because to make sense of the whole idea of fields, you had to double the number of fields in the Euclidean case. And um, and again, from my experience in lattice gauge theory, what you find if you try to put um, spinners on a on a lattice in a, in a sensible way, you, you you typically end up with a, a much worse doubling problem. You find that the things that are defined nicely on that that fit that work nicely on lattices have nice invariance properties are not not just two times as many fermions as you wanted, but like sixteen times as many as you wanted. They're called Sokovitz Suskind fermions. And if you go talk to people who do calculations with Lattice gauge theory, you'll think you'll find that's a lot of their problem is that they uh, they often have to do the calculations involving with lots of extra degrees of freedom they don't really want, and then figure out how to get rid of them later. Okay, okay. So now to get on to the next part of the story, so, so finally to get to this uh, to to the story about grab a weak uh, unification. So for first, let's um let's talk talk about just to say a quick few things about yang mills theory. So what we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna to try to put um, uh, general relativity, think of general relativity as a gauge theory. And if we wanna put it together with the yang mills theory, we wanna think of both of them in the same language. And so first, just very quickly, this is a, there's a standard geometrical language about yang mills theory, which is that from the mathematician's point of view, you have your space time, you've got this thing called a G bundle over it, that for each point in space time, there's this group of, of transformations and that that group can vary as you as you move around in space time and then the the crucial thing is that this this but this this these different copies of g come together with a connection which is some way of, of telling you that if you when you move infinitesimally how these g's are related and that connection is a is, is has values in the, it's a one form value in the Lie algebra you it has a thing called the curvature which form and then in the Lagrangian formalism the, the action you the Yanganel's action <clears throat> is given by taking this curvature and computing its its norm squared so anyway you compute its norm squared you, and, or in the Hamiltonian formalism the Hamiltonian is given by taking the norm you break up the curvature into electric and magnetic components you take their norm squares and add them together so but but that's the standard Yang Mill story in a, in 30 seconds okay but now if you try to do this in gauge theory, you, you can do the same thing. You say, well, okay, our, the group is gonna be the Lorenz group. And you just write down, and, and there's a, 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 a nice bundle, which is the, the, the 
you know, the, the orthonormal frames at, at, at a point in the space time. There's a connection on this bundle. It's called a spin connection. It has a curvature. But, but the problem, here, here's where the problem comes, is that, is that you actually have something extra. This is a, if you have a frame bundle, not to, which is not an arbitrary bundle, you have something extra. You have something that tells you if you have a vector on this frame bundle, you know, it, 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 the, at, at a point, the frame tell, tell, tells you, the frame tells you how to break that up into, into components, so the, the so-called fear box. So there's this extra thing. And then, but, but what you can do is, so, so you can write down an action functional, which you couldn't write down in the Yang-Mills case because you didn't have the E's, but now you've got the E's, so you can write this thing down. This is just the, the curvature of the spin connection, but you can use the fear binds to write this guy down. And then um, then what you do is if, if you get the equations of, very, of, of motion from varying the, um, the omegas, the, the connection, you find the equation that, 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 this, that it has to be the levy chivita connection, it has to be torsion free. If you um, if you vary e, you get Einstein's equations. So 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 and, and so th this is a, a a different anyway. This action gives you Einstein's equations. It gives you the standard torsion, standard kind of geometry. Okay, and now what happens if, if you work in Euclidean signature? Something funny happens that again, the the spin connection takes values in the Lie algebra of spin four, but but that has two pieces, Un unlike in in Minkowski space, it's got to, it's got an SU two piece and an SU two piece. So the thing you can do in Euclidean space that you really can't do in um, Minkowski space is you can break up your spin connection into right and left-handed components. And 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 so and and what I'm gonna, what we're going to do is just use the um, it, it, it's just use one component. And you can you can just look at one component, look at its curvature. And the really kind of truly remarkable thing, and this is kind of beyond behind the Ashtakar story, is that you can um, you can you can still get Einstein's equations. You can still get general relativity. One way to do this is just to take that formula for the Palatini action I wrote down, and instead of putting in the curvature of the of the whole spin connection, just put in the right-handed piece of it, and 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 you end up um, anyway and. Anyway, and, and remarkable, and you end up you can get the Einstein equations that way. You get the full Einstein equations. And if you think of these guys as these these, the connection and the curvature, what what they're doing, they're they're valued in the Lie algebra, but they're they're valued just in the in their SU two right Lie algebra. So they they act, you know, these these guys can act on right-handed spinners, but not on left-handed spinners. So in this picture, if you go and try to rewrite gravity in terms of spinners, it looks like it's, you can you can do it and, and basically get get all you want just by looking at right-handed spinners. There's no need for left-handed spinners; they just decouple. So. And then, um, and anyway, this is just to say, say the same thing in um, in, in Ashtakar variables. The uh, you, you do the same thing in the Hamiltonian formalism, and and it, 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 it's it's a, it's a long story. But the 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 only um, the, the thing that's good, different is just the dynamics. Instead of the angles Hamiltonian, the dynamics is given by constraints coming from diffeomorphism invariance. Anyway, but but normally one tries to do, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really having trouble hearing, I'm sorry, between the back. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, there there are a lot of problems with doing this it, it, when you know when you normally think about it. I'm just but but I'm just pursuing this idea. Let, let let's try to to just think about gravity this way and then see where this goes. But but yeah, yeah. I mean, th in some sense, that's the whole problem. Yeah. How do you actually? In how do you actually make sense? How do you really do this? Really decouple this? And, and as I'll say, you run into trouble. And and some some of the trouble I'm going to try to address, which is going to involve going to going to a twister space. But but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are good reasons that people that don't just say you can't just do this. Okay, and again, as from the work of Stefan, that, that, that you can see that the um, there have been attempts to, to kind of do this, to say, okay, well, let's just use the SU2R as the space-time symmetry. 
And then this SU2L, let's just try to do the weak interactions with those. And so what I'm... Yeah, yeah, the weak it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is one, anyway, this is what, yeah, I think I find this kind of idea very attractive because one of your problems you find whenever you try and write down unified theories, you find that it's actually very difficult to get them to be chiral. I mean, they, they really, they really want to be left right symmetric and um this is but this is, has built in left right asymmetry but but I, i'm just gonna so anyway we're i'm gonna have to speed up a little bit here but but the basic the basic idea is that i'm gonna try to kind of add some some new ideas to try to take this in a, in a direction that I, I think goes somewhere interesting starting with, with this this grab a week idea that the kind that stefan was working on which one is is to is to say look i'm we really live in, in a Euclidean signature space time, no matter what you think when you look around you. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're really going to stick to Euclidean signature, even though the physics seems to be Minkowskian. And we're going to worry about that later and hope analytic continuation will solve our problems. And the other is to notice this, this, this fact, which I can't really convince, I had trouble convincing everybody, I'm trying to convince you that, that if we do live at work in Euclidean space time, there is a distinguished direction. We have to distinguish a direction if we're going to recover physics. And then, then the next thing I'm going to do is, is going to use a different sort of geometry I'll talk about in a minute, use twister geometry to, to not just get this SU2 left, but to get the, to, to get the other U1 you need. And, and, and also to, um, and what's going to happen is that the, the Higgs field, the, this, this kind of chosen imaginary time component of the Fairbine is going to behave like a Higgs field. And to make this work and to make, to get around to make, to make all this work in a way, this all has to happen. You can't make this work purely on four-dimensional space-time. You actually have to work on twister space. And this is, I think, starts to get to the kind of problems I think you're, you're thinking about. Okay, so okay, so now I've got a problem that I need to kind of tell you about twi twister theory in, in very, very quickly. And twister theory is a, a really beautiful subject. Um, from my point of view, the really interesting thing about it is that Twister theory naturally works on complex space times where you've got both Minkowski and Euclidean space time as two real slices. And, and, it, and it gives you exactly the right arena to do analytic continuation. So um, most of what, if you, there, there's all sorts of wonderful um, books and th th ways to, to read about um, twister theory and, and pretty much any expository article about twisters by Penrose is, is an amazing thing to read or his book, The Road to Reality. There's a, for more details, there's this book of Warden Wells. But most of what he always says and what physicists say is focus on Minkowski space. And it's a beautiful story. I'll say a bit about it in a minute, but I'm gonna focus on Euclidean space. Okay. Okay, so as Euclidean, so here's the basic idea from the point of view of Euclidean space. Is it, well, the basic idea is that twister space, you say, okay, the fundamental object is a, is for a four complex dimensional space called twister space. And often we're gonna take that four dimensional object and then kind of mod out by the action of the complex numbers multiplicatively, and so we get something called CP3, which is geometrically not just the points in four-dimensional space, but the complex lines in four-dimensional four space. And conformal invariance then is, is built in, that the, the group SL4C that acts on this, it's the complexification of, of a couple of, of, of various groups, which are the conformal groups. So if you, this is a perfect way of understanding kind of conformal symmetry, because instead of a normal story about conformal groups, it's kind of complicated to construct them, but they're really, if you work in twister space, they really are just kind of real forms of the, of just, the, of just linear transformation. So we'll do, that's part of the story. The other thing about this is that, I guess so this is kind of the advertisement for twister theory, I guess, which is that the, the other thing I really like about it is that a point in space time is just, is gonna be a, a C2, a complex two dimensional space, subspace lying in C4 in C4. Okay, and so, and then if you mod out by C, it corresponds to what you call CP1, which is the complex projective space of one dimension, it's a sphere. Um, but it, but it, if, if you look, and, and if, if you look at all, 
possible complex two planes lying in complex four dimensional space. You get something in mathematicians called the Grassmannian. And, and, and this, this is the four complex dimensional thing, which includes the Minkowski space and the Euclidean space as real slices. But the, um, uh, let me, but just, just to say, and, and, and I think the most remarkable, one of the most remarkable things about this is that, again, the idea of spinners is completely built into the subject. That if, if you, the way you specify a point in space time is by specifying a complex two dimensional space, that is the spinner space. So spinners are tautological objects. They're anyway, yeah. They, they are they are they are the points of space time. Okay, so I want to do this in Euclidean space. Easiest and, and it turns out the nicest way to do this is use you use quaternions. You identify C4 with two quaternions, and you use the fact that the four-dimensional sphere is kind of the analog of CP1, it's HP1. It's kind of pairs of, of quaternions modulo quaternion multiplication. With this, and then you end up with this, this thing. But I'll, I'll draw a picture in a minute, which is. But, but basically, if you take all lines in, in four-dimensional space, and then if you take a complex line in C four and start multiplying it by quaternions, it, you, you you get a quaternionic line, and you get a point in S four. So you're 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 moving from this six-dimensional real space down to this four-dimensional real space with a fiber a sphere. And let me just. I think it's better to draw a picture of this. And so here's kind of the picture I have in my mind that here's, you've got a four dimensional sphere down here, each point of the four dimensional sphere back back up on this um, projective twister space is, is, is a, a two dimensional sphere, a CP1. And the way a mathematician would say it is that your, your CP3 projective, by, projective twister space is fibered by these spheres, it, 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 it's, it, it has all these nice, it, it, it really is a family of spheres parameterized by the, by the, by, by your, your space time, by your, your four, your four sphere. So, so this is really a, a crucial thing to picture to have in mind, because in some sense, my whole claim is that what we need to do is instead of writing down our quantum field theory here, we are going to, we're going to need to, to formulate it on here because it, it's up here in this space that we're going to see all the geometry I need to get the standard model and to get the Scrabble weak unification to work. I can't see it down here. I got to go up here. And, and, and the whole problem, what I'll, since I'll run out of time, I won't be able to say much about where, where the, where I, what I still need to do. What I haven't completely understood here is really exactly all of the details of how you go from everything we know about how to do quantum field theory down here to, to, to rewrite it up here in an interesting way. Where's the spinner? Where's the what? The spinner. The spinner. So, so this this CP one is the is 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 all all of all of the directions in, in spinner space. So above this point here, you could you could also say it's the quaternionic projective space. So above each point, there's a quaternion, but a quaternion is really a C two. It's also a spinner space. So and and this the sphere these CP ones are just kind of all the directions in the spinner space. So instead of trying to think about C two, you think about you mod out by the action of C and think about a sphere. It's easier. So then, so CP3 is a nice kind of compact thing you can work with. This, this is all Euclid, this is all Euclidean. Yeah. Okay. And so, so, so two ways of thinking about this, P, this, this PT is that it, it, is it, 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 the fiber, this is exactly what you're asking about. The fiber at a point is the sphere, the CP1, that's the projective, the lines in, in, the, in the real dimension, in the, in the right spinner space. But there's another thing, and okay, and, and this is where I, the thing that I, I don't unfortunately have much time to explain, but you can also, this is one of the great things behind twister theory is that you can think of these points in a fiber, not only as in terms of spinners, but you can also think of what they tell you is they tell you that if you look at the four dimensional real tangent space down at the base, that the points on the fiber above it tell you how to identify those four real dimensions as two complex dimensions. They give you what's called a complex structure. You know, it's, a, it's, it's some kind of linear map of the four dimensional space that when you square it gives you minus one. It tells you what how I is gonna act. So if you wanna, so one whole problem with four dimensions and when thinking about the four dimensional sphere is you really would like to do you like to make, you really like to think about complex manifolds. You know, if you have complex coordinates, all sorts of nice things happen. You have holomorphicity, Riemann, 
Cauchy Riemann equation, all sorts of great stuff happens. But there is no way to put complex coordinates on the four dimensional sphere. You can't. And there is no way to do it even at a point. You know, even globally at a point, there's a topological obstruction. There's no almost complex structure. So what Penrose says, okay, well, we really should do complex geometry. But what we do is let's consider all ways of putting a complex structure at each point. Let's put them all together into a bundle that's projected twist your space. And, and both of these um, definitions, the nice thing about them is they these definitions also generalize from S4 to any four dimensional Riemann, Riemannian manner. It maybe have to be a spin if you want to use spinners, but um, you can you can do this. So some mathematicians who do Riemannian geometry in four dimensions, one of their crucial tools is is what they call the twister space, which is the analog of the um, of PT. And what happens is if the metric and the base space is anti-self-dual, then the twister space is a complex manifold, and all sorts of very very nice things happen. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so, so now, now what, I, what I've argued is that if we're gonna, do, for, for, for what we, if we wanna recover Minkowski space time, there, there's, there's something which wasn't in that picture, which was that our choice of an imaginary time direction. And so here's a picture again, so here's a picture now. So, you know, choosing an imaginary time direction, I mean, it's kind of corresponds to choosing an equator, choosing a tau is equal to zero subspace down here. And up, up here, it's a, it means that PT acquires a new structure. P PT now has a um, a five-dimensional hypersurface, which is a uh, you know uh, which is fibered by these spheres, and w w it's a family of spheres w w which give you the S three when you. Oops. Sorry. Okay. And then the um and, and so 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 this is the picture you really have in mind. There's this extra structure sitting up on on, on projective twister space. Which, which we're going to need to recover Minkowski space. Okay, and 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 this subspace actually determines the Minkowski space geometry. I think. Let me skip this for a second because this is going to get a little bit too complicated. But but maybe um, let me let me just give it another picture first. So so what what the way you get what happens in Minkowski space is this. So points points in, in Minkowski space time also correspond to. To CP ones in the projective in, in the projective twister space, but the um, but if if you complexify Minkowski space and look at complex space time, you get all you get all complex lines in um, in PT. The, the actual Minkowski space, the points in Minkowski space correspond to lines CP ones that lie inside this five dimensional space, and the um, the, the point is you know back that that S you know, there, there's a the S3. There's an S3 of these that kind of nicely fibers the five dimensions. But um, but if you have two different any two points in the Kowski space correspond to these CP ones, which are, are written as lines, and but it, generically they're going to intersect. If they're not space-like, they're going to intersect. And if if they if they intersect, it basically says that the it basically says that these two points when when they intersect, it says these two points are kind of light-like related by um by this. Okay. Um, anyway, so so I think let me have to then say this. So, so, so that the claim is basically this is where I'm going to have to start referring you to my paper. Is that really if one is that if we do work up in the projective twister space, then then we can get this gravitational gravity weak unification to work in this Euclidean space form. That there's an extra u one. That u one is just the u one picked up by the complex structure. You know, the complex structure. Once you've identified a complex space, you can multiply by e to the i theta. That's that's the u1, and it varies as you move up and down in the fiber. You get a different you get a different u1. So this you have a kind of a u1 symmetry, but it's where it's going is kind of moving around as you move up and down in the fiber. But but this gives you the u2. And then if you think of your, of your um, imaginary time direction not down on the base, but up on the twister space, you lift the vector up and Think of it up in the twister space of vectors that are going to project down to the right thing. Then this U2 acts on it. It's a vector in C2 because the tangent space has got identified with C2 by the choice of complex structure. And then the um, the U2 symmetry that I found here up, up there acts on this just you know the normally way that unitary matrices act on C2. And 
and the cho whenever you have any choice of a Higgs vector of, of an imaginary time direction breaks the CU2 down to U1, which is exactly what you want to happen in your electroweak theory. Okay, then again, then now, now it, it turns out you can also, if you're on CP3, you have, a, you have a complex, a point on PT is a complex line in C4. There's, there's also a, a there's also three more directions. And you can think of these maybe as the quotient of this quotient space of C4 mod that line. So there's, a, there's, there's also a, a, a three dimensional, each point you specify is also specified as C3. And the claim is that, that you can actually think of that as giving you a, that actually gives you the SU3 group, which, which, which has, you can get an interpretation as being, you know, the, 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 the SU3 uh, internal symmetry of, uh, of the strong interactions. And, um, so we found that the choice of a point on, on S4, you know, decomposes two quaternions into, into H and H and picks out SP1 cross SP1 and SP2 and um, choosing, thinking of a point on PT as a complex line. Uh oh, so, sorry, this is wrong. This, this should say C3 plus C, that's a typo. So it, break, it breaks it up into C3 plus C3 and picks out SU3 subgroup. So, so this gives you basically, basically all the symmetries that you want for the standard model together with these kind of spin rotation symmetries you want in order to do gravity. Okay. Anyway, so this, this is a bit of a calculation. So, so, so you, it turns out you can actually package all of the, um, the matter fields of a single generation with, with the right properties under these, these groups just by this as, as kind of linear maps from C4 to itself as Matrix as four by four matrices, but on on one side you break up the C four into C plus C three. On the other side you break it up into these two kinds of, into left and into left and right spinners. And you act act on one side by the U one cross the U one and the SU three, and you act on the other side by the two by the two SU twos. And everything, all the symmetries that you got, all commute with each other in the way that they're supposed to for you. But it, this this is a at least to my mind, this is a kind of also an, an, an independent of everything else I'm saying. I think this is kind of an interesting observation about the pattern of, of how the matter fields of a single generation behave under the symmetries we know about. And, uh, and you can work this out for yourself. So if I, I can anyway, this is also in the paper. But if you if you if if you, if you write write this out in terms of anyway. It, it, if you write this out and use the fact and, and, and use anyway and use a, use a couple of fairly straightforward facts, you you end up showing that that this product is exactly that this sum is exactly the sum of the um, the, the kind of different charges you need you, you need for, for for the particles in the generation. So I'll leave the I won't try to work work take the time to work through this since I'm running. No, I mean I, 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 I'm doing something slight, somewhat unmotivated here. That I, but I, I, I'm, I'm saying that there, there, I think there's some interesting ways to motivate this, which I'm not completely sure about. One, one is is actually to go back to Kogut Suskin and say I'm doing Kogut Suskin. What makes sense on the base if I lift it up to the? Um, it's basically the exterior algebra down on the base. If I lift it up to the twister space, I'm going to get a C4 times a C4. And if I operate on one side. By these guys, and, and on the other side, by these guys, I, 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 this, this, this drops out. So it's um, but, but this is some. I mean, I'm. This is somewhat unmotivated. I mean, I, I kind of know. Anyway, I, I, I know in the end that this is what I want. But the fact that I can get this, you know, not in a very ad hoc way, but, but you know, by making these kind of choices about the geometry, that it's kind of remarkable. But it's an observation. Okay. And then, okay, so now we're, we're fi finally getting to the end of this about what I, you know, how do you get from this to something that you can actually, you know, do real calculations with and make a prediction and actually tell you something that you can check against, against the real world. Well, one, one thing that's missing is that I, I really have no, I have, I personally have no idea why there are three generations, but that there's, there's nothing I've seen in what I've been doing so far that says you should have three generations. And then if, but, but though, though maybe there's maybe one interesting 
thing observation is that you know everything we've been doing uses the CP3, the six dimensional object, but there's actually, an, in some sense, it may be more natural to work, you know, to take your C2 and just look at unit length objects, which is a seven sphere, instead of look at, instead of CP3. So, and 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 if you work with a seven sphere instead of CP3, this has all sorts of kind of the seven sphere is really a truly amazing object. It, it has several different kinds of completely different kinds of geometry. So it, it has the usual kind of real geometry here that you can take, do eight dimensional rotations, and then look at the ones, the ones that leave a, a vector invariant on the sphere are seven dimensional rotations. But, but you can also look at spin seven mod G2 and, 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 and that turns out to be the seven sphere also. So it has this kind of G2 geometry, or you can look at, um, in some sense, the kind of complex thing is 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 that spins is that you're looking at spin six mod SU three that kind of corresponds to the complex geometry of CP three, and and the quaternionic stuff that we're talking about in some sense tells you this that spin five which is SP two which is two by two quaternionic transformation mod SP one so so there's quaternionic complex octonion in some sense octonionic and in some and, and real kind of geometries of, of the of the seven sphere and which are all very different and and we've in some sense used the complex and the quaternionic ones but have done nothing at all with the um with the octonionic or the, uh, the g2 so if i had to hope first that where, where you might get generations or something interesting it would be by by somehow <clears throat> smuggling something about the octonion or the or this geometry into this picture Okay, and then um, then just as, as I kind of said before, um, part of my problem is that I, I really don't have a, a good, I don't really don't know how to do all the, every, all the usual stuff I do with the angles and the base, exactly how it works up on CP3 there. If you have, um, if you have anti self dual connections and there's this beautiful story about anti self duality on the base gives you homomorphicity up on PT, and then you can translate. But if, if you have a general connection, you don't, have a nice story, and um, there, 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 there's a set. Anyway, you don't you don't have a nice story. And then again, I mean, the, the one thing which I haven't I haven't thought much about, which which is the obvious thing to be thinking about it, of more physical interest here, is that what um does this tell me anything new about about how to quant how, about quantum gravity, about how to how to how to do how to do quantum gravity? In some sense, I've kind of carefully rewritten things to. So that the electroweak theory and, and GR don't interfere with each other, but the um, the one thing that's different is the Higgs particle is one component of the of the fear bind, but in, in Euclidean space. And so may, maybe maybe so this this is my question more for people who thought a lot more about GR than I have is that all these reasons why you can't you normally say that oh you can't just you can't just quantize the this theory in the way you would normally do a gauge theory, you know, because of renormalizability or all these other problems, you know, does, does this affect that argument or does this give you something new? Anyway, so just, just to finally sum up and to finally say what I, why I find this really, really attractive is that one is what I said that is that spinners are these tautological objects. I mean, every other way I know of thinking about spinners besides twister theory, spinners are kind of things that you have to kind of bring into your theory by adding in a lot of complicated structure. Um, here, spinners are the points of your theory. They're just there at the beginning. And, and so, and since the world is kind of base matter is all spinners, this, this is a, a good thing. And this, this business, this, this actually allows you to think in the same, Twister geometry allows you to think in this, both about Euclidean space and Minkowski space together and, and, and see how to analytically continue between those geometries, which otherwise is very, very confusing and hard to do. And the, the fact that you get exactly the internal symmetries, I think is remarkable and that you get, um, you can easily get the, the, gen, the, the, um, the standard model properties of a generation correspond to something quite simple in this picture. And, um, and, and again, well, and then there's this possibly new new chiral formation of, of GR. So that's okay. Oh, and, and then just again, that this is um, at some kind of fundamental level, a conformal symmetry does seem to be some possibly a big part of our picture of nature. And this, this twister theory kind of stuff builds that conformal symmetry in from the beginning. So I think that's 
that's it. Okay, so that's all. Stop there. Okay. Any questions? So, uh, so you, you started with the protective the crystal space, and then you saw how you get it out of uh, the sphere, the four sphere, right? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you started with the protective crystal space, and uh, you went down to the S4, right? Right, and you said there's a natural uh, skin structure there, which is inherited by the protective crystal space. Is that, is that right? Is that, is that, I understand that. Well, I, I think the best way to, 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 to say, I mean, inherently in terms of spinners, what projective twister space is, is you, you just take the, you know, t take the, the half spinner bundle over S4 or, or, or whatever four dimensional manifold you want, take the spinner bundle and then just projectivize it. So look at that spinner bundle and just mod, mod the action of C. Right. That, that is your projective twister but, space. But, but, yeah, but that's my question because we know that you do not have a, a spin structure Right, yeah, yeah. So you cannot do this process. Only a special class of, you know. Well, they, they, I mean, they're, they're topological obstructions to spin structures, right. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, and, uh, yeah, but, but you can, so I, I, I think, but, but you always do, much more generally, you, you have a spin C structure. So you, you probably have to do something, it's called a spin C. You, you have to throw in an extra U1 and play with it. And yeah, so so for more for gen, more general manifolds like, um. If your space time was CP2, for instance, that doesn't have a spin structure, but it does have, there is something you can do, but you have to kind of throw in an extra U1 and think about it. I, I haven't really thought about that, but. but. And if I may, one more yeah. question. So uh, there's another procedure that uh, you can generate internal symmetries and generations and all that stuff, the dimensional diffusing from. So is this. Can I think we structure on the parallel story, or, or uh, can I get? Is there a, I guess my question is: there a collision line equivalent? Yeah, I I, I, I don't I don't think so. But I mean, one problem with the collision line thing is you often, yeah. I mean, you, if you try and do that, you, you often have this problem—the problem of getting chirality, getting right. chirality. Yeah. But the um, the collision line thing is kind of different. You're doing um, you you've got a kind of a conventional theory. I mean. The, Maybe the thing to say is that the one thing I know about theory up on, on PT is that I can't just take a conventional Lagrangian and, and put it up on PT and say, I'm, I'm gonna collude to find reduce. And partly, because really what's happening is that the, the, the fiber of this projection is, is a CP1. So I, I have to somehow exploit holomorphicity on the CP1. I have to use the fact that there's really only kind of one holomorphic if you look at holomorphic, if you say that I'm not going to look at all functions up on PT, I'm going to look at ones that are holomorphic along the CP1s. Well, holomorphic functions on a sphere, there's only one of them. So that that's the nature of the reduction happening here. It, it's a, it's going to be a reduction of kind of exploiting holomorphicity up on the top, except, and you know, and, and if if your base space has, if your base connection is anti-self dual, then this works nicely. And this is the whole big thing of the twister program. If it isn't, then you have to do something. You have to kind of generalize the twister program, it looks to me, and and not not ask about, you know, work with general Dirac operators, not Bilbo operators. And um, that, that's where this seems to be going to me. But it, it, it looks to me that I, I need some, yeah, kind of a, a new formalism, which is not, which doesn't quite exist right now, to, to, to talk about to talk about that, and, and it can't just be glue of time. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. I'm joining from University of Connecticut. I'm a thinker. Um, so um, I'm curious about the the idea that you brought about the conformal symmetry. Um, I'm wondering um, since the um, Einstein-Hilbert action is not uh, conformally invariant. What is your thought of using a conformally invariant action to start out with and vary it to get, get the equation of motion instead of starting with a 
con um, action yeah. that is not conformally symmetric. I have to say, I mean, this, this is exactly, I'm afraid that this is my, I think this is my question more for you or for, for other people. This is, this is exactly the sort of thing about quantum gravity, which I've over the years looked a little bit at, but never had a really deep understanding of, you know, like what are the ways you can modify gravity and perhaps exploit conformal invariance or whatever. And, and, and can, does this tell you anything new about them? But I wish, yeah, yeah. I, I'm afraid it, the information flow probably would have to go the other way. I, I would have to ask you or other people. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, so you um, talked about the Palatini action. So what I feel like is that you can um, trans um, well translate Fairbinds back and forth with the the metric and the Ricci scalar and so on. So does the, um, I'm really curious. Uh, I think I did not get that. So I'm wondering if you if you are using those Fairbinds in, in the QFT model, does that mean we can go back and forth between the um, the stand the 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 geometrical uh, quantities like uh, Ricci scalar, Ricci tensor? Uh, within the theory? I'm sorry, yeah, I, I don't really understand the question. I mean, oh, I, I, what I was saying there really was, was nothing new. It, 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 it's just a standard fact about what happens if you try and write gauge theory, write GR as a gauge theory, that, that that's one of the, to me, the most straightforward way of doing it. But it's it's not something, um, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm, yeah, getting into the de details of that, th th this is, it, it's not something I'm particularly expert at, and, and it's not something I was, that's really at all new here. It, it's just part of that. There's, there's a standard, there's a very, very long history. It's kind of interesting. You can, yeah, you can go back and, and look at Einstein and Schrodinger. I mean, they, they were struggling with this back in, what, the 30s and 40s. And so th this is a story with a very, very long history. And um it's it, 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 it's kind of complicated. So I was just telling a, a kind of oversimplified piece of it a, a little bit. When, oh, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And did, did, I, yeah, yeah, this went by, sorry, this went by too, too fast. I started to uh, Yeah, so, 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 so the, the, I mean, these are just basic facts. So, so, so these facts are actually true about the simplest. This is actually before you start doing spinners and get into all the complicated stuff. Yeah. So if, if you try and, and write down even kind of the simplest scale, scalar field theory that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation in, four, in the case that's four mentions and say, I want to do Euclidean quantum field theory. And there's there's a long literature about this because because people who actually wanted to prove anything about quantum field theory, they wanted to prove that, you know, 5-4 theory actually makes sense. And, and nobody has still quite managed to make sense of 5-4 theory, really, whether it makes sense of four dimensions. And, but they were able to prove it in two and three dimensions. Um, so if you look at that li literature and what I, I finally spent a lot of time looking at that literature and understanding it, then you and you look at, at what they're actually doing, you, you, you start to note, note, notice these, these aspects of it, that the people who are, who were, had just, you know, they, they were mathematical physicists used to working in Minkowski space, trying to get operators defined and trying to get them to work. So in the 70s, they started to realize that, wait a minute, if we just go to, go to reformulate our quantum field theory in Euclidean space, then it has these very different features and it kind of it, it kind of really turns into a statistical mechanical system and the problems become problems of statistical mechanics and you can do it but th these were just um 
I mean, di different aspects of, of kind of the differences I was trying, trying to say. I mean, and for me, one of the most crucial ones, which is the, the one I really can't get people to believe is really true, is the fact that, you know, in Minkowski space, there is no, there is no direction. There is no, you don't have to choose a direction in time or direction in space. It's all just the same. If you want to write down your space, your Euclidean, Euclidean space, if you want to analytically continue it to Minkowski space and define states and operators, you have to pick a, you have to specify a special direction because your state, one way to say it is also in the path integral language. If you, if somebody tells you, okay, I'd like to do path integrals, where are the states? How do you find states in a path integral? Well, you do, what you do is you pick a hypersurface and you say, let's do the path integral as a function of the data on that hypersurface. So even in a path integral, you, I mean, you, the, the minute you're trying to find states, get states out of a path integral formalism, you have to break, you have to define a hypersurface. You have to pick a direction, and it's the same, same, same thing. So I don't know if that helps. But it, but 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 these are all aspects of it. Yes, these are all. I mean, it it, it, it took me a while to kind of in, internalize these things. I, I kind of I, I I had certainly never realized that you. You inherently do have to break rotational symmetry. That's a really bizarre thing in four dimensions. I mean, I, I, I kind of realized, oh yeah, the fields operators now all, all commute. That's kind of weird. Um, but I hadn't really kind of thought about how weird that is. If you try and think about, so, so maybe, maybe an, another kind of general lesson of all this I wanna say is that at least when, when I started thinking about this, in my mind, it was like, well, there's, if you wanna understand how to relate Euclidean and Minkowski, when you look at endpoint functions, the relation is just analytic continuation. So there's the, there are these general kind of holomorphic endpoint functions on complexified space, and you just go from one to the other. So I said, okay, well, Euclidean quantum field theory and Minkowski quantum field theory, they're just kind of restrictions of some overall holomorphic quantum field theory. That's what I, I, I had in mind. I think that's what most people have in mind. If, if they're, but that's really not true. They're, they're too, they're not special cases of some overall, there is no overall holomorphic thing. It just doesn't exist. And these are two very, they're two very different things. And it, it's kind of shocked me how, that when I finally realized this was true. Any other questions? I, I, again, I, I think you're, you're asking me questions about GR that are beyond what I normally think about. And I, re I really should, should also kind of admit that I spent a lot of my life kind of avoiding thinking about GR because there are all these smart people doing quantum gravity and they weren't getting anywhere. So I thought I should think about something else. So, so, so yeah, my, the depth of my understanding of GR and how this works is, is, is pretty minimal. And I'm, I'm now learning more as I go along. So I, this is something, again, I really need to learn from other people. Actually, I, I think I realized I, I didn't. I didn't say one, one, one thing. I really did want to say, which is another thing I find very compelling about this twister point of view, which is that. So I, I, when I gave you this picture and said that each point in Minkowski in space time, Minkowski space time, is a sphere, right? It's a CP one in, in in this picture. That sphere has a beautiful physical interpretation, and this is a, you can read about this in Penrose. It's just what the twister philosophy says is that. The fundamental objects are not the points of space time, but they're exactly what you get them when you open your eyes. When you open your eyes, you see a sphere, the sphere of light rays. That's that's what the point you're the point of where you are in space time is that sphere you're looking at. And that, this I think is one of the anyway, it's one of the most fantastic ideas about twister theory. And you can um, I urge everybody to kind of read some of Penrose's papers and more explanations of this. So, so maybe this is another one of these questions that uh, you would prefer the information. So I guess this this picture about the projected twister space seems to be very fundamental to what you're using. But if you want to go beyond, you know, uh, sort of flat space twister theory, presumably you can't you can't view projected twister space as just gross material, this right. violation of rest anymore. And I just wonder if there, there's like 
anything you can say about what types of uh, projective twister spaces, you know, it, like, is there anything known about, like, any other, let's say, simple solutions to VR and what their projective twister spaces look like? And then your custom case, can you say about, I guess, I guess probably the twister space or uh, maximally symmetric space is this pretty well understood as well? Yeah, well, well one, but, one thing. Well, four dimensions is, is very special. I mean, there, there, there's also the things you can do in more general. So actually, people who do um, people who do representation theory and, and group group theory, they, you know, they, they 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 have a general notion of this twister theory, and they do this in arbitrary dimensions. So there's all sorts of amazing stuff. And but in four dimensional geometry, um, I forget. So so where things really work out nicely is again this this anti, if you have an anti self dual metric. So, so four-dimensional Riemannian manifolds with anti-self-dual objects correspond to these compl to complex twister spaces, and 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 that's a, a beautiful story. And so, and so, so Penrose, um, this goes back to Penrose. So, so he was able to then then you've actually got so much structure. You have some integrability. You can actually explicitly write down these anti-self-dual metrics. So, that, so there is a long and beautiful story about people doing that kind of thing. For, but but it, but it, it, it does seem to only work nicely for you know self dual or anti self dual metrics, not for arbitrary metrics. So then, if I was to look up like projective twister space, Euclidean projective twister space, I guess I would look at like, the study of Yeah, I forget what the name of it is, Penrose. But 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 I mean, again, I really recommend if you look at what Penrose did. Um, I mean, a lot of his of his expository writings are kind of. They give some of these basic ideas, and then at the end they say, "Well, I'd like to do gravity with this, but I haven't really succeeded. But the coolest thing I found is is is, is this that, that, that how, how to get metrics of ASD spaces using the, this twister construction. So 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 that's explained in a lot of places. You know, what, what by him. Okay. Spin three half. I can. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not not here. Higher spins, yeah, and I, I really, I, I really haven't thought about it, the higher spin things. I mean, the, um, the, the I mean, the, this Penrose construction does give a beautiful interpretation of of arbitrary, massless arbitrary spin wave equations become kind of holomorphic objects on um, on projective twister space. So there's a version of that for spin free has, but 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 for any spin, but but I, I, I really stuck to. Just thinking about spin half, but not higher spin. The Well, I, yeah, I just don't see anything interesting to do with this. I mean, actually, <laughs> maybe to, 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 so one connection, possible connection between this and something that's more conventional is that, um, in some sense, the kind of number of degrees of freedom here is suspiciously like that of n, n is equal to four super Yang Mills. So I'm talking about a Yang Mills theory. With this kind of four by four matrix of internal degrees of freedom, well, that's kind of like n is equal to four super Yang Mills. So, one kind of vague conjecture, which <clears throat> I don't have any particular evidence for, is that what I'm actually talking about here is actually some twisted version of n is equal to four super Yang Mills, where you've twisted internal and space space time supersymmetry that in, in, in a very unconventional way. So. I'd love to talk to somebody who knows n is equal to four super Yang Mills much better than I did, who and who understands all its twistings, who can uh, tell me whether that's possible. But, you know. but if I may ask, that relates to my previous question, that I just keep doing this and doing this and doing this I 
don't think you can do the fraud regarding. Sorry? The next screen is what you see the next Of course, yeah, if it's been one half, uh, yeah, but for higher speeds, there's also gate speed, gate symmetry, that all these things, that's not speed. There are no fields, there are equality classes, and, and um, so the existence of feeling speed or on the manifold puts constraints on the fluid. Yes. Well, of course, you can take the spin one half and take product, but, but that doesn't mean that this is the highest spin, it's still spin one half. Your theory doesn't have high spin. Your theory doesn't have gauge symmetry. That's right. And I should say, philosophically, what, what I feel that I'm trying to think about is really some kind of picture of kind of what is going on at arbitrary short distances. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that this is supposed to be a picture of that. I, the idea is that some fundamental sense of real world is at short distances is conformally invariant and kind of looks like this. So, so the global geometry, yeah, maybe is I, I, I'm not really, I may not be saying anything at all about. You know. and for the beginning, I think uh, for me, again, this is a little helpful. The, the two competing pictures is that on the one hand, almost the definition of particle theory is special relativity, which brings them in close to be structural. And on the other hand, is the fact that we can do only Gaussian integral. Yeah. Right. These, these are the two conflicting uh, features here. Well, you only can do per, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, one one of the aspects of this, I think, what's actually got people very interested in on this twister stuff. The, the people who actually use the Euclidean twister stuff most of the past were people who were actually looking for solutions of the um, self-dual Yang-Mills equations. We're not nonlinear, so people looking. So, I mean, I first heard about this, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when people were trying to solve Yang-Mills theory by doing a semi fossil expansion around, uh, um, you know, around instantons, instanton solutions. And, and people are, and, and what they realized is, okay, well, we can actually find instanton solutions using these methods. So, so again, again, you can change the problem of finding instanton solutions to finding anti-self-dual connections to to finding certain kind of problem in algebraic geometry about holomorphicity. But um, so, so, so that does get you beyond the um, kind of perturbative thing. But um, and 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 if you're self-dual, if anyway, in some cases it gets you way beyond it, but only in very special backgrounds. Sorry for the kind of um, that's fine. Very challenging hey, no, game status yeah, of this uh, seminar. And I figured that this is if this is gonna be the first time you're doing this in a while, it's gonna well, take take a while to.